Hello, everyone. I was absolutely thrilled when the organizers of FSCon asked me to talk about diversity and inclusion. I had never thought of myself as someone you would turn to for a talk on this topic. But then again, I was sure I could figure something out. After all, diversity and inclusion are important values for me. And even better, the organizers asked that I share my thoughts in the form of a TED Talk. I have learned so many interesting things listening to TED Talks in the past years. A colleague of mine even said once that I had listened to a TED Talk on everything. But that wasn't true. I had never listened to a TED Talk on diversity and inclusion. A quick research on the website showed that, to my great surprise, there were quite a few on the topic, quite a few that I had never found or never paid attention to. And then it struck me, agreeing and even cheering for diversity and inclusion in my daily life does not necessarily mean that I'm knowledgeable about it. And it certainly does not mean that I am doing something meaningful to make it happen around me. So I dived right in. I listened to those TED Talks, Googled the topic and asked people around me for relevant material. Now, allow me to share with you a few things that I have learned in the process. I knew that there were tangible benefits to diversity and inclusion. A report published by McKinsey in May 2020 confirmed it. Companies in the top quartile for both gender and ethnic diversity are 12% more likely to all perform all other companies in their data sets on profitability. Moreover, there is a substantial performance differential, 48%, between the most and the least gender diverse companies. It is possible that this increased profitability is related to innovation, Rocio Lorenzo reports in her TED Talks that diverse teams are more likely to innovate, helping their companies gain a competitive edge. Better financial performance and more innovation. Opting for diversity and inclusion at all levels of the workplace seems like a no-brainer. One would expect that the publication of these results would be sufficient to trigger massive change in all industries. Why is it then that the needle is barely moving? In 2019, McKinsey reported that female representation on executive teams in their sample of US and UK based company rose from 50% in 2014 to only 20% in 2019. Across their global data set, gender diversity moved up just one percentage point between 2017 and 2019, from 14 to 15 percent. Appallingly, more than a third of the companies in their data set still had no women at all on their executive teams. Things are not moving faster for the representation of ethnic minorities. Globally, this proportion was 14% in 2019, a meager 2% up from the number measured two years before. In Canada, the Canadian security administrators compile and publish every year statistics on gender diversity in the board of directors and in executive teams of companies listed on the TSX. The CSA Women on Board report, published in March this year, tells a story that is unfortunately very similar to that of the McKinsey report. Despite some progress, only 20% of board seats are now occupied by a woman. Only 6% of companies have a chair of the board who is a woman, and only 5% a woman CEO. These last two numbers have not moved much in recent years. It is encouraging to see, however, that the number of companies with at least one woman on their board now stands at 79%, when it was only 49% six years ago. That is certainly a step in the right direction. But is the presence of only one woman on a board sufficient to make a meaningful difference? 
Unfortunately, only 20% of companies have three women or more on their board. There is clearly still a lot of room for improvement. At this rate of progress, how many more years must we wait to reap the full benefits of having diversity and inclusion in our companies? I also researched how things were going for women entrepreneurs. I was shocked to learn that in Canada, women are less likely than men to seek financing, to seek and, and receive financing. And did you know that firms wholly owned by men are four times more likely to receive venture capital than firms wholly owned by women? Moreover, anti-black racism and stereotypes amplify the barriers for black women. The Black Business and Professional Association based in Toronto recently reported black, that black women entrepreneurs are less likely than other entrepreneurs to access financing and mentorship. Black women entrepreneurs often own small self-financed businesses in the service industry, which makes them among the most vulnerable to disruption by the pandemic. I have also learned that generally, when we think entrepreneur, we think men. A group of Canadian researchers analyzed the content of the Globe and Mail between 2017 and 2019. They found that in 149 articles dealing with entrepreneurship, 60 only quoted men as entrepreneur or subject matter experts compared to 24 which only reference women. And of these 24, 19 were specifically about women entrepreneurship, mostly talking about the barriers that women face. Also, men are typically presented as born entrepreneur, pursuing their passion. Women are more likely presented as pursuing entrepreneurship out of necessity or as an extension of their work. We need to change that. We should celebrate our woman entrepreneur, our woman in fintech, just like the Digital Finance Institute has done so in 2019 when they published Canada's top 50 women in fintech. Giving more visibility to women of all ethnicity, succeeding in areas that are typically men dominated is an important step towards having more diverse boardrooms, executive teams and entrepreneurial ecosystem. If the promises of diversity and inclusion are not enough to trigger mean meaningful changes, do we then need more regulation? In 2014, the CSA introduced new disclosure requirements for a company listed on the TSX in the following five areas. The number of women on its board of directors and in executive officer position, whether it has, and if not, why not, targets for the number of women on its board and in executive officer position, a written policy related to the identification and nomination of woman director, a selection process that consider the representation of women, and director terms limit or other mechanism of board renewal. The objective of these disclosure requirements is to increase transparency on gender diversity and on the action undertaken by companies to achieve it so that Canadian investors and other stakeholders can take informed decisions. Increased transparency is also good for the broader public. The numbers that the CSA compile from these disclosures, the same statistics I referred to earlier, provide us with a good picture of gender diversity in Canadian companies. And great news, the CSA is now considering how to extend the existing requirement to a broader definition of diversity, including ethnicity, among others. While the increased transparency around the gender diversity in our public company got the discussion started, some are advocating for measures beyond the comply or explain, more forceful measures such as hard quotas. They argue that we need such measure to accelerate the pace of change, to make the diversity needle move quickly and meaningfully. Do we need such new legislation in Canada? 
That's a question for our government to consider. In the meantime, we must remember that while legislation can indeed force a change in behavior, that does not necessarily mean that the culture of our companies and organization is also going to change. There is a difference between a discussion about values and aspirations and a discussion about some metrics to be met. The discussion about diversity and inclusion should not be one about statistics or compliance alone. Here, we need to take a closer look at the difference between diversity and inclusion. In her TED talk, Janet Stowell says that diversity is a numbers game, whereas inclusion is about impact. Authorities can mandate diversity, but human beings in companies have to cultivate inclusion. The McKinsey report concludes in a similar fashion. Evidence reveals that an emphasis on representation is not enough. Hiring diverse talent is not enough. Providing training a couple of times every year is not enough. Employees need to feel and perceive equality and fairness of opportunity in their workplace. They must feel that they belong, that they are heard, that they are seen, and what they bring to the table matters. They must feel included. Beyond the necessary numbers, statistics, and disclosures, I believe that the key to meaningful change and a faster pace towards equal opportunities resides in each one of us. Cheering diversity, in in and, cheering diversity and inclusion is great. Doing something about it is better. And this is why I would like to take the opportunity I have today to challenge you to do something about it. Preparing this talk made me realize that I have been standing on the sidelines, enthusiastically and wholeheartedly cheering for diversity and inclusion, but without a real commitment to introspection and action. I truly believed that I was part of the change, but then I saw that I was only a spectator. Diving into the research for this talk made me realize that my knowledge of the topic was superficial at best. The few hours I have put in my preparation taught me so much about unconscious biases, microaggression, the consequences of ra racism in the workplace, but also about the value of mentoring and sponsorship, the impact of diversity on innovation in the firm's bottom line, as well as the many, many ideas to foster belonging and inclusion at work. I was a cheerful spectator. Now I truly want to leverage what I have learned so that I too can contribute to moving the diversity needle. And you can too. Where do you start? That's easy. Prepare a TED talk on diversity and inclusion. Put in a few hours of research. The information is out there, easily and freely available. You don't have to write a PhD thesis, just a 10 minute talk. Think about how what you read relates to your community or your workplace. Think about what you could do to change your work environment so that others feel the equal opportunities, so that others feel included. Give your talk during a team meeting to your friends over a virtual cocktail or even to your family. At the end of the talk, do not forget to challenge everyone in your audience to do a presentation on diversity and inclusion too. I'm sure that many of you have never thought of yourself as someone who can give a talk on diversity and inclusion. And that's exactly why you should do it. Thank you.